Good day and welcome to the Foley's Financing Energy Projects web conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. Jeff Aikens. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. So we want to welcome everybody out to the fourth installment of, of our boot camp series. And, and for a little bit of background, we've, done, we've had three over the last several months prior kind of boot camp series focused mostly on the energy industry, but, but you know, fairly relevant across many industries. Some of the prior boot camp series were regarding the FCPA, um, buying distressed assets and, and bankruptcies, and, and this current session will be on financing renewable energy projects, and we have a couple other sessions coming up in the next, in the next uh, two, two months that will cover EPC and construction contracts and warranties and joint ventures. So if, if you, you know, had missed any of the prior sessions and would like the, the materials or to actually view the webinar, those are all of these are, are on our website at Foley.com and the, the webinars and prior, the prior presentations are available on that site. And if you need that, you can reach out to us or you can just find it directly on the website. So, we're excited to be here. We have a great panel today with, with Ed Hammond and John Eliason. Uh, my background is Jeff Atkin. I'm the chair of our solar energy team and have been here at Foley for 12 years, worked with John and, and Ed for uh, many of those years. And our practice at Foley is a little unique in that we have a fairly balanced, you know, kind of 50-50 blend in representing, on the one hand, lenders and investors, and on the other hand, representing sponsors and borrowers. And I think the three of us that are on this, you know, uh, webinar today, pretty much what we do every day is help projects find money or monetize tax credits and, and get, as a result, you know, get money, or we help investors and lenders come, you know, place money in the space and that's that is a lot of what we do is part of that matchmaking and then the sort of the related documents to, to make sure that that this, the structure is solid so w with that i want to introduce our two other panelists john elias and ed hammond john is really one of the leading tax experts in the renewable energy space he he's kind of he's in washington dc and he's been working in the last couple of years specifically you know, hand in hand with a number of the folks at Treasury as they help develop and provide guidance on the 1603 cash grant. And has, John has helped many of our clients structure deals uh, to, to really utilize that. Now we're going into additional phases with back to the 1603 or back to the ITC and PTC. Um, but that's, John's been very active on that front. I wanted to give, you know, give John just a minute, John for the audience, Perhaps you can give give a sample of, of a deal that you've worked on recently, uh, something to just give a little flavor of, of kind of the day-in, day-out stuff that you do. Sure. Thanks, uh, Jeff, and hello, everyone. Uh, I, right now, I'm, I'm seeing uh, uh, transactions kind of at, at kind of in all levels of, uh, um, of the industry. Uh, we recently closed a, a $300 million wind farm transaction in which we represented a tax equity investor. Uh, that transaction was structured as a prepaid power purchase agreement uh, uh, deal, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, just so you know, for now, it's, uh, in that structure, the tax equity investor purchases uh, the wind farm and then enters into a power purchase agreement with an off-taker. Uh, and under that PPA, there's a partial prepayment for the power. And that's a real nice structure when you've got a, a tax exempt a, a municipal utility involved uh, who can uh, who might be able to issue tax exempt uh, bond uh, bonds to uh, to make that prepayment. Uh, other things I'm seeing right now, um, I'm um, working with a um, with a, a developer who is entering into the uh, residential uh, solar um, uh, uh, space, and that's a very popular space right now. 
And then we're also uh, working currently with a tax equity investor who's looking to close a series of uh, distributed solar um, projects on um, various uh, 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 various uh, municipal uh, buildings in your neck of the woods, Jeff. Excellent. And so, so thanks, John. I mean, that's helpful. And, and I can kind of attest having worked with John for several years. I mean, he's, uh, you know, excellent lawyer and, and, and a particularly practical tax lawyer. And that's something that in our space that's so tax driven that, you know, very helpful to have a solution oriented, you know, tax person and team member that can help really structure deals to get done and get done right, um, as opposed to, to just kind of, you know, naysaying or, or kind of, you know, canceling deals we want to do. So, so very, very helpful on that front. John's been, I think, a great asset on that. Ed Hammond, our other panelists, Ed's represented banks, sponsors, um, you know, borrowers for, for you know, years. I, I know I've personally worked with Ed for 12 years on credit facilities and, and several billions of dollars in financings just in that space alone. Ed, do you want to give a little sense as well as some of the, the areas in, or maybe a recent deal in energy that you guys have worked on recently? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, yeah, as Jeff indicated, I'm, uh, I, I guess I sort of personify the, the, our practice in the, in the finance area, spending over the years, I would say, roughly uh, half my time uh, on each of the, uh, the lender, investor, or the, or the sponsor, borrower side. Um, in, re in recent years, we've done a lot of uh, um, renewable energy finance deals for uh, both for our independent uh, um, power uh, clients and for, for uh, uh, the, the renewable development affiliates of, uh, of some, some larger, uh, well-capitalized um, uh, investor-owned utilities. Um, one sort of particularly interesting challenging deal we did last year was a was a portfolio financing uh, not not real big in terms of dollars but it was but it was uh, it was for the uh, solar development affiliate of a of a, a large national energy company that, that self-financed the construction and they and then when they uh, when, when they had nine solar projects across uh, three states uh, ranging in size from from one to about nine megawatts and when, when the projects were all at or near um, commercial operation, they put them in a portfolio and went out for financing. We ended up doing it uh, as a private placement with a, one of the big life insurance companies. Um, so that, that's just a, a recent example. Yep. Well, th thank you, Ed. And so with that, we'll jump into some of these slides and, and just, I guess, a couple of points on house some housekeeping items. The, again, the program is an hour long today, and we, we will apply for a, one general CLE credit for some states if you're licensed in New York, New Jersey, and Kansas, or, you know, or Kansas, there, you'll, you'll need to fill out the attorney affirmation form that is attached if you look at the screen in front of you. Uh, you know, the, in the materials, there is a form there for that. And you'll also need to write down a course code number, which we'll give out at sort of, uh, you know, 50 minutes after the hour or 55 minutes after the hour. So, so pay attention for that. If you don't get that, you can also email us. Um, if you didn't hear it correctly, email us and get that, that co course code number a little later. So with that, we'll jump into... The slides today, we're going to just cover a couple areas. I'm going to cover a couple of slides just generally relating to project finance and setting up the two bigger areas that, that Ed, you know, John and then Ed will go over in more detail later, and that's first the tax equity financing, and then, and then second, Ed will cover some specifics in debt structures and, and issues related to that. So as to, to start us off, a uh, little bit of background. We see in, in kind of basic financing of these projects that, you know, off, often we've got construction bridge that, you know, early on some, you know, there's a number of ways that, that you know, sponsors or borrowers may finance initial development and construction of a project, but it's, it's also fairly common the bigger the project bring in construction debt, turn, turn into or take out, you know, permanent term debt, you know, following that. 
Uh, generally speaking, I mean, it, it ranges based on kind of the credit of the borrower, the credit of the project, if, uh, the specifics, but 50 to 70 percent of the project cost might be covered. And the, the facilities could be separate or combined into a single agreement, so agreement that just converts into term debt at the option of, of, um, of, of the sponsor. There, there's also a number, you know, when, when you run into, and Ed's going to cover a little later, some different types of financings available and, you know, vendor financings or other uh, kind, of, kind of tiers of financing. And you do run into some interesting intercreditor issues and sometimes difficult on that front. Um, and, Ed, I don't know if you want to preview one or two items from that, but uh, that, that's an area that is always, you know, a lot of times borrowers want, want to structure will get as many sources of, of, of money coming in or that they can get to pay for it and put as little of equity down as they need to. And, and sometimes it actually ultimately ends up creating probably sometimes issues that, are, that, that may not be worth the headache. But I don't know, Ed, if you want to preview yeah. a couple items there. Well, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to some of these uh, later um, in a little bit more detail. But the, uh, there, there are potential inter intercreditor issues between between the, the the senior project debt and the and the tax equity that I think John will talk about there there's um, if, if the sponsor does a back leverage financing which we will talk about there's issues between the potentially between the back back lever uh, lender and the and the project lenders in the, in this context in the you know in the um, construction permanent financing um, the thought here is really just there, there may be you may get some dislocations in the in the handoff between the construction lender and the and the permanent lender if it's not the same uh, the same institution and uh, the, the 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 takeaway from this one is just to uh, keep keep the lines of communication open and make sure that that if you've got multiple institutions involved filling different pieces of the capital structure, just make sure each one uh, understands w what, uh, what their relationship is to the whole, to the whole uh, structure, and, yep. and make sure that they, they understand and accept that. And, and sometimes the, these things are fluid, and it can change over the course of the deal. And if that happens, just consider the, the ripple effects of what one change might have on, on another piece of the capital structure, and, and make sure, again, make, just make sure everybody understands what's going on. So. Oh, yep. Okay. Thanks, Ed. So, in in moving from the construction financing, there's in the permanent financing. There's there's often various tranches of 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 debt that's in there. Some could be fixed rate, long term debt. We see, and and this might go to just generally who we're seeing in the market providing construction and permanent debt. But in you know some of the debt can actually extend pretty pretty lengthy. And there are some companies, insurance, life insurance companies, pension funds, and folks. Who are looking to place debt over a very long period of time, and quite frankly, the rates are in you know are fairly you know can be fairly attractive. Well, something we've seen recently in the last couple of years, a number of the Japanese banks have probably uh, been some of the biggest players in the debt the debt space. If you look at you know Union Bank, Sumitomo, Mitsui, a few of these folks, and life insurance companies and the pension funds on the long term items, and then recently. Uh, re recently, we've seen a handful. I would say, you know, this year alone, we've closed I think six facilities with with you know fairly large facilities with Chinese banks, and most of those companies were somehow e either the developer, sponsor, equipment supplier. Someone had a connection with one of the the you know ten primary Chinese banks, and they were able to to obtain fairly favorable pricing and terms. Um, for for the financing, so that's something we're seeing that's new right now. On the tax equity side, you're, you know, 25, 35 percent of the to total capital structure funding typically happens just before placed in service, and and usually the proceeds pay off, you know, most or, or, or all of the construction financing. I'll move through a couple on the on the sponsor equity, just as as stepping back, big picture. It, it varies as well based on the specifics of the project, but anywhere from 5 to 15 percent typically it can be a little more. Um, sometimes they can get away with a little less, uh, but that's generally what we say. We see it's you know many times the sponsors motivated by trying to you know retaining a long-term control of the project, and so that after the tax equity or the tax equity structures are set up such that 
in, and this is the classic kind of flip example we talk about where the project comes back or the upside uh, is realized by the sponsor. In some areas, you know, we see we see sell leasebacks and, and other structures that that for the most part, you know, remove where the you know, the sponsor is effectively selling the project for the long term and not keeping it. And the tax equity investors might be a little more active and looking at the long term control of the project. Financing sources available, as as mentioned, there's the bank bank market, uh, as, as as some of these other deals we've seen on the private placement institutional debt, tax equity investors, John will go with that in a minute, balance sheet and project financer, you know, pr for the project sponsor, this is something that's interesting. In the U.S. renewable market, um, it, it hasn't been as common because of the tax benefit, you know, attributes, but in the long, in, in the international market, particularly uh, Latin America, you know, Asia, you know, we're seeing it in Japan, China, other markets in, in, in Europe and Spain and Germany, this was also prevalent, but it, you know, balance sheet financing of a lot of these deals was very was very common because it was so cheap and easy for these big developers, big IPPs, you know, big sponsors to to pull off. And we're starting to see some of that again in in you know in Asia and in in Latin America. The vendor financing, hopefully, we get a few minutes at the end to talk about that. Is also an area where a num is growing. I mean, Ed and I, I think. And that must have been four, four or five years ago when, you know, 2008, the market really kind of crashed where we, we, we represented a major contractor who stepped in and, you know, through, through funds they had available financed hundreds of megawatts of construction of, of wind projects and some solar projects. And through that, I mean, you know, there was a 200 megawatt project that literally was dead and through that financing, they were able to basically bridge finance the deal, get it constructed, get it going, and that gave confidence to the, the construction lenders, who I think in that case it was Robo Bank, but who to step up a couple months later, construction, you know, financed the deal. They were able to get their takeout financing, and and that project was built. And that 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 is in in a couple of areas in solar and areas where we're seeing vendors and other contractors have resources to bring to the table and we're starting to see some interesting and, and pretty you know, potentially advantageous structures uh, for for sponsors and other other lenders yeah so that's uh, that's a good good uh, uh, example of, uh, of a project participant if, if they have the luxury of being well capitalized and they can afford to defer payments on their on their contract they, they can step in and literally save a project and at the same time, they they can earn they can earn a return on on that financing. So it's a really it's a great opportunity for for everybody. Yep. So a, a little background. We'll just run through this quickly so I can get it over to John on the financing transaction process. Typically, you go out get a commitment letter. You know, not a guarantee for funding, but sets forth kind of the key terms. Definitive loan documents will be negotiated. Closing certificates, opinions, depending on the project specifics, will be needed. The typical structure, um, you know, will also have, you know, under the construction loan, loan disbursement procedures that will have a number of requirements or items that need to be, uh, you know, achieved in order to, to receive those loan disbursements. And it's really that the project's keeping on track, that they've got the proper lien waiver. Right. It's, on it's budget, the, everything else. Yeah. The, the work's been done, it's been paid for, and, every, and the project is on schedule yep. and on budget. And, this is uh, this can be a painful process. It's document intensive, a <laughs> little bit expensive and painful, but but that that's just the way the way it's done in the construction financing uh, yep. business. So, and yeah, so tax, equity, tax equity has some of these very same concerns, uh, and they're going to look for these things to be completed as well. Yep, a lot of ways these will go hand in hand. So, so and that's something where. You know, we kind of help a, a well a well thought out project and and you know documented project and construction process will really help streamline this with with the banks and with tax equity and and say you know really save everybody a lot of time and money. So construction financing, the maturity again generally two ways that the construction loans repaid either a third party takeout requirement. On, with the permanent financing, or it's a conversion into term, into term debt. The sizing of 
of the project. Again, this is really primarily based on the PPA payments and the revenue from the debt side, and and you know then based on the expenses as as you know little, little so a little more modeling into that on the tax equity side. John can get into that structure, but it's a you know in that case they're monetizing the tax benefits, so it's a little bit different. But that's sort of the general a general overview of what what we're looking at. Uh, I'll turn it over to John to spend you know 15 minutes or so on on just the tax equity side of things, and then we'll move move back to Ed Hammond for the debt side and more specifics. John. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I think that just as a general overview, um, when you think about a monetizing uh, the monetization or monetizing of tax benefits, you kind of have to ask yourself: Is that how did we how did we end up to this place where where we need to do these complex transactions? Uh, you got to keep in mind that the federal government, I, and I'm going to be speaking principally at, about uh, at the government at the federal level, uh, they incentivize renewable energy development by making tax benefits available. However, uh, developers, I know there's several developers on the phone, uh, so, so this will ring true to you. Uh, developers usually don't have uh, the ability to utilize uh, those uh, benefits uh, effectively. So developers, uh, uh, need or desire to get uh, tax equity investors involved uh, uh, so that they can pass the tax benefits to an outside investor, uh, and in doing so, the developer can share in, in those benefits. Uh, uh, the one um, problem which really, I guess, keeps me employed is that under current federal law, uh, you can't just sell tax benefits. Uh, rather, benefits typically flow to the owner of an asset. That means that we need to structure transactions in a way in which the tax equity investor is viewed as an owner for tax purposes. So if you think of, if you think of tax equity as a form of financing, then by monetizing the tax benefits, uh, a developer uh, has basically obtained a lower cost of capital than it would have gotten without uh, the monetization, and that's a, it's a win for both parties. Uh, you know, it's clear that um, I think everyone on the phone um, likely realizes that these are uh, incredibly complex transactions. And because they're complex, it limits the pool of tax equity investors who are interested in doing these deals. Uh, basically, while any corporate taxpayer with tax liabilities could benefit from participating in a deal as a tax equity investor, participants tend to be parties that have traditionally participated in project financing like banks and, and insurance companies. John, on that front, I mean, I think this is an area, you know, where we historically there was a handful of tax equity investors, and and kind of going forward, we're seeing more corporate investors. But can you give a flavor of maybe who who have been some of the the tax equity investors historically in the space, and what kind of investors are we seeing? Who who's coming in, and who are some of the new entrants in the market? Sure, it's it's still uh, it's still a pretty uh, limited limited group. Uh, U.S. Bank is, uh, uh, is a huge player in the space. Uh, uh, they um, participate in both renewable energy transactions and also in, in other uh, credit transactions. Uh, J.P. Morgan is a leader in the space. Uh, um, we see MetLife, uh, Wells Fargo, Union Bank, uh, Bank of America. Um, you know, we're starting to see State Street, um, PNC um, Bank is, uh, is doing deals. Uh, on uh, kind of new participants, uh, Google is uh, is one that um, uh, is looking to get involved. I mean, they've done some of their own transactions um, for basically for this, not really, I guess, technically a monetization transaction. Although they're also participating in various funds that are set up, and I suspect that we're going to see uh, see additional uh, additional kind of folks like Google who. Uh, like like the idea of renewables, um, just kind of on a on a, a, a corporate um, social level. Um, uh, you know, I know Apple's kind of looking at doing some things. Um, so uh, so I, I do think we're gonna we're gonna start seeing some more of those folks come in. But it it is kind of a hard it's a hard sell uh, to someone who hasn't done these deals in the past because um, basically what they're doing is they're doing a transaction in which they're um, they're basically gonna get. Uh, either um, uh, they're going to get an allocation of losses um, in uh, at least in the beginning of the transaction, and 
uh, business folks in, in uh, corporate America, at least, are, uh, tend to be compensated based on their ability to bring profits in the door, not losses. So it's, it, there is some things that, that people have to struggle with uh, in, uh, in participating in the space. Okay, I've listed here on, on this slide uh, the the, uh, the basic uh, uh, federal tax benefits that um, that folks are interested in. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention these types of benefits um, that are that are most common, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about them. Um, uh, so our focus, uh, at least from my uh, what I'm seeing on the federal level, it's it's really an investment tax credit, the ITC the production tax credit, and then accelerated depreciation. Uh, I, I, I listed the Section 1603 crash, cash grant here. Uh, we're still seeing these deals. Um, however, um, you know, the program um, has ended, so it's really the tail end of grandfather, grandfather transactions that we're seeing. Uh, I also put state, state benefits on, on the slide. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today, but it's really just a reminder that uh, that states um, often provide a, attractive incentives, either in the form of tax credits, uh, property tax abatements, or, um, or RECs that are offered at the state level. To talk about these, uh, the federal benefits in a little bit more detail, uh, the investment tax credit, or ITC, uh, has historically uh, been viewed as a tax credit for solar, um, but wind and other renewable energy uh, technologies can also qualify for it. and um, uh, it's typically, at least for solar, it's a 30% it's a credit, um, and that percentage goes down to 10% after 2016, assuming that the 30% isn't, isn't preserved with a change of law. Uh, the ITC is claimed in the year that the, the property is placed in service. It's the year that it's basically ready for commercial operation. Um, if, if the property is transferred within the first five years, there's a, a pro rata recapture of the credit that's claimed. And that's, it's basically 20% a year. So if you, uh, if you transfer your project in the first year, you're going to have 100% recapture, while in the second year you have 80%. And it goes down from there. Uh, as a tax credit, the ITC provides a dollar-for-dollar dollar offset against uh, taxpayers' tax liability. That's extremely valuable. Uh, tax credits are, are uh, as good as cash for uh, people with tax, uh, tax liability. Uh, the production tax credit, uh, it's a 10-year credit uh, based on production. Um, it's different um, from the ITC because there's no recapture. Rather, you're, you're calculating your, your credit in each year of that 10-year period. Uh, wind is typically uh, the energy source we think of um, uh, when we think of PTCs. Uh, PTCs are not available for solar. Um, the, the PTC is currently set to expire at the end of this year. Uh, you basically um, got to uh, start construction of your asset this year uh, to uh, have quali um, qualification after 2013. It remains to be seen whether that changes, although what I'm seeing here in Washington is that you know, Congress can't do anything, so I'm, I'm not that hopeful that they're going to extend it. Um, the PTC is, um, as I said, it's production-based. Uh, the ITC is, is cost-based, so what we see is PTC is typically more, value, uh, more valuable for a high-producing asset. A uh, high energy generating asset, while ITC is typically more value, um, valuable for higher cost, uh, higher cost assets. Uh, on depreciation, this is another tax benefit uh, that it's not limited to renewable energy. Um, uh, it's basically favorable cost recovery. So, um, so in the Internal Revenue Code, we have uh, we have accelerated depreciation and bonus depreciation. Accelerated depreciation allows the taxpayer to deduct the cost of renewable energy assets over a short period of time. So instead of over like a 20-year 20, 20 useful life, you're, you're recovering your, uh, your expenditure over five years. And it allows for a front loading of those depreciation deductions. So, um, so if you think if like a pro rata uh, uh, depreciation as a base case, accelerated depreciation just brings more of those deductions in the first few years of that five-year period. A bonus depreciation is kind of turbocharged um, accelerated depreciation. Uh, it provides an additional 50% uh, depreciation allowance in uh, the year that the asset is placed in service, and then the rest of uh, the rest of the cost of the assets recovered under under makers of the accelerated depreciation rules. A bonus depreciation expires at the end of the year. 
it remains to be seen whether it gets extended. Okay, so in a tax equity investment, we want to transfer, transfer the tax benefits to an investor. Uh, as I said earlier, we can't just sell the benefits, uh, so we typically need to bring, and we typically need to bring the investor into the transaction as an owner. Uh, that's difficult because basically everybody in the transaction other than the tax lawyer views the investor as, an, as, a, as a lender. Uh, so, uh, so tax equity investors are, are, are typically not all that keen on taking um, the types of risks that uh, the tax lawyers require of them so that they could be viewed as, uh, as an owner for tax purposes. Another difficulty is that a developer uh, may have some ability to uh, use tax benefits and may want to stay in the deal as an owner as well. And then, and then that just sometimes can complicate matters if, uh, uh, if for example, they want to hold on to a third of the, a third of the benefits. Uh, um, I've listed here on this slide uh, the various structuring options um, that we typically see. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to put up a bunch of slides with a bunch of boxes and lines, kind of showing how all these structures work. But I did want to just talk uh, talk through them quickly. Uh, for our partnership structures, a traditional partnership that's really a developer and investor. They're partners in the transaction. They own the asset together and they share the benefits pro rata. You're going to see that in a situation where you've got a developer who could use some, but not not uh, not all the tax benefits available. Uh, the partnership flip transaction uh, is a very popular structure. If you ever go to any industry conference, you're always going to hear people talking about the partnership flip. In a partnership flip, the tax equity investor gets an initial allocation of tax benefits, um, usually at a 99% level. Uh, while the sponsors uh, or developers getting a 1% allocation. And then after the um, tax equity investor uh, uh, achieves whatever yield has been negotiated, then those allocations flip, and thereafter the um, tax equity investor will get an allocation of around 5% with the, um, the sponsor getting, getting the balance. And at that, at that point, the sponsor will typically have a um, have a fair market value purchase option to basically uh, take out the tax equity investor, take out that residual interest, and, and, and be the sole owner. Uh, the uh, PAYGO structure, um, that is a, uh, it's, it's a PTC partnership structure where an investor uh, makes an initial investment of part of its, uh, its capital commitment um, initially and then funds the, uh, the remaining, its remaining capital commitments over time as the PTC benefits come in. Uh, those, these, those were popular years ago, and we're starting to see them, again, um, where, where people are, want to use that in, in PTC deals. Uh, there's some complications there, uh, really just kind of on the tax side as, as to how, how um, uh, the parties will be viewed as partners and whether those allocations will be respected, but, um, but that's definitely um, something that, that is heating up right now. Uh, other financing structures that you'll see, uh, the sale leaseback structure, uh, this is a structure that uh, came to, um, uh, to renewables from years and years of um, basic project financing. Um, sale leaseback structures have been used to uh, finance everything from, uh, you know, energy networks to airplanes to vessels, you name it. Um, in the deal, the developer uh, uh, usually is the one that's constructing the asset and then, and then sells it to the investor and immediately leases it back. Um, and then at the uh, and then holds it for the lease term, and then at the uh, at the end of the lease term, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the developer lessee will have an opportunity to uh, to buy back to buy back the asset. Um, uh, we'll we'll typically see um, uh, a solar deal structured as either partnership flip transactions or sale leasebacks. You're not going to see a PTC uh, structured as a sale leaseback because. Um, because a, a, an, an owner in a sale leaseback transaction has a passive role as a as a lessor, which uh, which doesn't work for uh, for qualifying for a production tax credit. Uh, another financing structure we see is an inverted lease structure, sometimes also called a, like a, a master lease structure. Uh, that structure takes advantage of a special provision in, in the tax code that allows for a lessor and lessee to uh, to get together and agree to pass through the investment tax credit to the lessee while the lessor keeps the depreciation, um, the depreciation benefit. So that's another situation where um, a, uh, a developer who wants to take that lessor role 
um, may have some tax capacity, but not enough to, uh, to benefit from the investment tax credit. Uh, the prepaid PPA, I started out uh, in, in my introduction describing one of our transactions there. Uh, they, they tend to be very similar to a sale lease back transaction. Uh, the developer uh, uh, will sell a project to a tax equity investor, 100% of the project, and then an off-taker, which may or may not be the developer, uh, enters into a power purchase agreement and makes a partial prepayment for energy. Uh, and then typically the off-taker will have a, um, a purchase option at some point during the, um, uh, during the um, power purchase agreement to, uh, to acquire the project. Um, on all these structures, uh, you know, as I said initially, the, the prepaid PPA is a popular structure when you've got a tax-exempt off-taker um, because it can issue tax-exempt bonds to, to make the prepayment. Also, when you've got tax exempt entities involved, uh, a, a sale lease back structure is not typically going to work because um, because if you lease to, if you end up leasing to a tax exempt entity, um, you screw up your you screw up your tax benefits. Um, sale lease backs, as I said, are, are, uh, are typically uh, reserved for um, investment tax credits. Um, we typically see that in, in solars. Uh, partnerships are typically reserved for um, PTC deals, although um, that we do see those in solar as well. Uh, when we um, uh, when we want to complicate things, um, uh, we will uh, will bring debt into a tax equity deal. Um, uh, tax equity um, structures uh, support debt uh, pretty well as long as all the participants kind of understand their, their specific roles in the deal. Uh, sometimes we'll see a tax equity investor also providing the debt, which is kind of the best scenario because you know they're going to get along because they're, the, they're the same or affiliated party. Um, the, um, uh, I put up, up here just a couple uh, uh, catch words. Um, uh, you hear a lot of people talk about back leverage, but you know sometimes people don't know what that means, so I'll start there. Um, all of back leverage means is it's basically um, it's upper tier it's upper tier borrowing. It's where a sponsor is uh, is is borrowing to um, uh, to make uh, to make its uh, capital contribution in in a partnership transaction. Uh, this is the kind of um, borrowing that um, that Jeff alluded to, where you're basically you've got balance sheets borrowing um, at an upper tier sponsor level. Uh, project level debt. Uh, that's traditional project financing. Uh, the the the, um, the asset that serves as um, the security security for repayment. Uh, one of the things that comes up um, when you add when you add debt um, in these transactions is this question about um, forbearance. This is where the tax equity investor uh, uh, asks uh, the lender to. Um, to hold off from um, uh, foreclosing or taking possession of, of the asset during the uh, during the ITC five-year recapture period, because if the lender does step in, that's going to cause a recapture of the tax credits for the tax equity investor. You might imagine that that not all invest uh, not all lenders are comfortable with that. They may want the tax equity investor to to step in and cure the default rather than. Uh, Agreeing to uh, forbear on on its enforcement just to to provide the um, the investor a benefit in what the lender is viewing as a broken deal, uh, so that ends up uh, that ends up being a negotiated item, and and what we typically see is that um, once again if you've got a lender who is quite comfortable in uh, in providing uh, project financing and is quite comfortable with understanding the risks in a renewable energy transaction, then uh, you have a Higher likelihood that you'll you'll uh, that a tax equity investor will um, be able to convince them that forbearance is a good thing, um, but you know it, that really does depend on the strength of the of the parties negotiating. Yeah, John, I would I would just interject there that you you, you can get um, some lively discussions uh, about about that, but but parties do generally come to terms. But from from the from the senior project. Lender side, you, you can imagine they're not they're not accustomed to being asked to subordinate in any way or, or forbear from 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 exercising their rights in favor of anyone else in the in in the capital structure. 
they're they're normally at, you know the the top of the heap and they call the shots. And then on the on the tax equity side, the, as as you said, these are the the institutions providing the tax equity are are uh, institutional investors, and they uh, they don't really think of themselves as as equity. They uh, with no, with no rights uh, until everyone else has been paid out. They're 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 making an investment. They expect a return, and they're they're going to negotiate uh, contractual rights that will allow them to protect that that investment. So, but it, yeah, if you get sophisticated players who understand, how, you know, that that they've each got interests to protect, it, it'll work out. Yeah. The 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 only other thing it's not on the slide. The only other thing I wanted to mention on when we add debt to a tax equity transaction is that. Uh, there's sometimes there's some issues on timing. Um, uh, on a sale leaseback transaction, for example, uh, the tax code the tax code allows you to wait until after your project is placed in service before you tax, bring tax equity investors in. You've actually got three months after you've gone operational um, before you close that deal. Some tax equity like that because then the, then they basically view themselves as not taking any construction risk. But you might imagine that that um, kind of makes the construction lender a little nervous because they may have to wait to uh, to be taken out of the deal after it's operational, and that's typically when you you see your permanent debt come in. So there's sometimes some discussion there just about you know how do you, how do you substitute the con construction uh, debt with tax equity and your permanent financing. So I think from there, Ed, I'm going to turn it over to you to go through uh, the debt structure and the and the terms you see. All right. Great, thanks, John. Uh, actually, I um, just want to, one more quick comment on, on back leverage. Uh, John mentioned um, that this is a, essentially a, it's a corporate financing at at, uh, at a level above the project somewhere in the in the owner sponsor's corporate structure. So it's really it's not a project loan. It's a it's a corporate loan um, that's essentially secured by the the upstream uh, equity. Uh, interest, uh, the distributions flowing up, up to the sponsor from the project. So, in uh, sort of in, in finance lawyer speak, that we we call that a, a structurally subordinated uh, loan. And and uh, but but with that, and this gets back to the inner creditor issues we mentioned earlier. Um, the the lend the, the the back lever lenders. Uh, even though they understand generally they they don't have any direct claim against the project assets or the uh, or the or the project revenues, um, they often do uh, interject themselves and try to negotiate certain certain rights uh, rights to get notices uh, rights to be involved in 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 some of the decision making if 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 uh, if unexpected events occur, uh, all, all um, aimed at at again at at uh, protecting. Uh, their investment um, uh, up in the up in the uh, upper level structure. So that's another one of our uh, inner creditor issues that we have fun with. So, <laughs> and the on the on the debt structure, um, I, I'm in the time we have left. I'm going to um, try to just give a quick survey of of some selected issues in the, in the in the mm -hmm. project debt. Um, uh, for starters, and I think I'm going to skip ahead uh, to the next slide. And this is, uh, apologize, this is this is Project Finance 101. That probably everyone in the in the audience knows this, but it, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, norm, normally, these these project uh, project uh, loans are non-recourse to to any corporate credit, the, the project sponsor or any other corporate credit. Um, so, so that the the only source of repayment is the is the project itself and the and the revenues generated by the project. So um, naturally, that that results in in uh, a real strong focus by the project lender on the project assets, the project contracts, uh, the, the 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 credit worthiness of the project counterparties, and all of that stuff. Um, so. So if when you're uh, uh, and we, early in the slide or in the in the slide deck we skipped lightly over the the, the due diligence process, but in, in putting together a project, you, um, if you're going to go out for financing at any point, um, the, the the sponsor really needs to sort of bear in mind that um, when when it comes time to do the financing, the the, the lender is going to come in and really go over. 
uh, everything everything about the project uh, in in very close detail. And 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 this is a lender whose whose tolerance for risk is likely to be a lot lower than than the project sponsors was. And uh, so uh, so. Again, it's it's like the old adage in project financing: you do you negotiate your deal once, and then you bring your lenders in, and you and you renegotiate the whole thing again to satisfy the lenders. And uh, so we, um, it, it helps to bear in, bear that in mind at the first stage and try to get it done uh, in a in a manner that you think is um, going to be satisfactory to the lenders, so you don't have to do it again. Um, and in particular, the the third party one area that that uh, um, we always have a lot of fun with is the third party uh, agreements in particular the um, the second to last bullet here on this slide consents and agreements from the from all the project participants so the the, the PPA counterparty uh, EPC O&M contractor um, uh, the um, if if you're negotiating those agreements in advance of financing uh, you want to make sure that uh, that that you get the right to assign that contract because the lender is going to require collateral assignment of the contract, not outright assignment, but collateral assignment, giving giving them the right to step in and uh, uh, take over for the for the project owner in the event of a default, and potentially to assign it further on to a, to a re replacement uh, owner operator. And and the various other rights that uh, that the lender is going to want vis-a-vis -vis the project counterparties. We'll come to that in a second. All right. One one area that that's often a subject of of negotiation is is mandatory prepayments from the project. I've just listed out uh, some of the some of the significant events. The, essentially, this is. Um, uh, Unexpected uh, sort of special events that that trigger generation of cash from the project, and lenders typically require uh, those to be applied to pay down the debt. And uh, from the project owner's perspective, depending on what the event was, but for example, the first one, condemnation or casualty events. Obviously, if the if the owner wants to uh, keep the project going, they need they'll need those uh, insurance proceeds or condemnation proceeds to repair or rebuild and and uh, there are um, you, you can negotiate uh, reinvestment rights uh, subject to a number of terms and conditions to, to keep the project going move on to the uh, uh, the, the waterfall provision so one, one of the other uh, Typical structures uh, in in project financing is is and this is another right that you need to negotiate with uh, with the PPA off taker. Certainly, any project contract that that contributes that that it generates the revenue stream, um, the lender is going to want to require those payments to be made directly to a controlled account, either with the lender or with a, a collateral agent, sort of a, a typically a corporate trust department of a financial institution that that holds the holds the cash and then you in the loan documents you set up this waterfall that uh, provides an advance for for the allocation of, of, of revenues and um, this is a sort of a fairly sim simple typical waterfall structure and the the, 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 the the general order is number one you take care of the project so operating administrative expenses for the project and they have to be in accordance with the budget of course and the, the budget gets approved on an annual basis by the lender and there's limitations on the the, the owner's ability to modify or amend that budget um, and then you take care of the lenders so their fees and expenses uh, interest and and principal and other sort of debt service type of obligations and uh, and then you make sure all the reserves are funded up. And typically, there's a debt service reserve fund and a major maintenance reserve fund. There may be other reserves too, depending on on the project. And finally, at the end of the waterfall, if there's anything left, uh, there there's uh, uh, distribution can be made out made made up upstream to the project sponsor. Although Normally, that's subject to some distribution uh, conditions, and we'll get to that in a second here. So covenants, uh, 
the, 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 the debt service coverage ratio is usually the most important covenant, and it, it may or may not be a maintenance covenant, meaning that, that the, the project's got to got to achieve a, a, uh, a ratio of, of uh, income over, over uh, ex expenses on a, on a periodic basis. Um, quite often, uh, uh, the sponsor will, will be able to negotiate uh, um, uh, no maintenance covenant, but, but rather uh, it, it becomes a component of the, um, the conditions uh, prior to payment of dividends. So, uh, so no dividends unless uh, the project on a, on a both a, a forward and, and backward looking basis uh, has achieved something like 1.2 to 1 debt service coverage. Um, another area of, of uh, scrutiny is, the, is the, the, the owner's ability to modify project agreements. As I said, the project agreements are the, 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 the heart and soul of the, of the lender's collateral, the lender uh, will approve them before, before making the loan, and then if naturally doesn't want them amended further down the road during the course of the project. And from the project owner's standpoint, uh, you know, stuff happens, and they, they're looking for flexibility to adjust things and make changes in order to keep the project going. So that, that's always a, a subject of negotiation. I think I'll move on here. I talked about sort of sample distribution conditions. So, um, so the, the usually somewhere around 1.2 times uh, both historical and projected debt service coverage, and then reserves funded up, uh, other obligations are taken care of, and of course no default or event of default. And and if you meet all those requirements, uh, distributions can be made. If not, uh, the cash at the end of the waterfall just gets trapped and gets held until such time as you do meet meet these conditions. And typically, if if the project is struggling and, and uh, enough time goes by without meeting these distribution conditions, that uh, that trapped cash at the end of the waterfall will be required to pay down the debt. Okay, so we talked a little bit about contractor vendor financing, and and uh, uh, just want to give a quick overview of this. Uh, so a project contractor can. If, it, if it's well capitalized and, and, and is able to defer payments, can can self-finance its own contract essentially by deferring payments. And this is typically a you know an intentional negotiated transaction with a, with a with some kind of a loan agreement, perhaps a collateral um, payment terms and so forth. And then equipment suppliers can also provide financing, again through through uh, deferral of payments. Um, uh, I, I put intentionally or not, because sometimes equipment suppliers find themselves in the position uh, of, of financing a project when they didn't intend to when they when they went into the contract. And uh, given given that, uh, uh, the, uh, it 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 pays to really scrutinize the terms of of the uh, of the equipment supply agreement, um, both from the from the potential lender and the and the borrower side to. to uh, to take account of what what terms may apply if if it develops into essentially a financing. So, for Ed, example, Ed, I'm going to I'm going to break break in real quick here at 55 after just to give the uh, the code for the attorney affirmation form in New York, New Jersey, and Kansas, and and that code four four digits it's it, it's B as in boy, H, T as in Tom and the number two. So that's B, H, T, and the number two. And we'll, we'll post that on here as well. But anyways, Ed, Ed back to you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So, um, for example, does the project, uh, do the project documents, contract documents, include a security agreement? Um, security agreements can get tucked into a larger contract as just one, one small paragraph. The the UCC requirements for a security agreement are, are very basic and simple. Um, I'll skip over the UCC filings. Just be aware that, that uh, this is a technical area, and um, uh, how you describe the collateral in the filing and where you file um, are sort of fact-sensitive uh, questions that, um, um, that you need to really look at carefully to make sure you do a, do a proper filing. Um, 
purchase money priority, typically if you're an equipment vendor, uh, you, you are going to, just by, by the nature of the transaction, you are going to have a, a purchase money priority vis-a-vis uh, -vis other creditors, even, even prior perfected secured creditors. And the, uh, the, only, the only thing to be aware of here is that if, if, your, if, if the equipment that you supply to the, to the project owner is inventory in the hands of the owner, you have some additional steps you've got to go through to, to um, maintain your, your purchase money priority. And it, it, is a, uh, it can be a very interesting question whether the, whether the equipment is inventory or equipment in the hands of the owner. So consider, for example, if the uh, if the equipment was sold to the project developer, but they're uh, they've acquired the equipment for a number of projects, and they're just storing the invent uh, storing the goods in, in a warehouse somewhere, uh, pending um, uh, further development and, and and projects being ready to accept the equipment, uh, perhaps inventory in the hands of that debtor, which changes the analysis for the for the purchase money priority. And then uh, I think finally here, third-party agreements. If if you're a if you're an equipment vendor and you think and you have a, a security interest in your stuff, um, it might not be worth a whole lot if you don't have the ability to go get the stuff if you're not getting paid on time. And um, and and the way to do that, or one one way to maximize your chances of doing that, is to get uh, uh, figure out where where the stuff is located and make sure you have an agreement in advance with uh, with the owner of, of, of that location, whether it's the warehouse operator or the, or the project site owner that gives you rights, um, rights to, uh, to go on site and, 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 and deal with your collateral. And, and, of course, and, and I think you know, this, is, this is kind of an area where we've seen a number of, of new contractors, new suppliers who come into the space in solar in particular who, 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 who just you know, maybe didn't think through those forms, and fortunately, over the last couple of years, we've been able to develop the forms that you know, the really the arsenal that that company would need to to protect itself in a in a you know a robust way, but not over over offensive way, and for sponsors as well to do it in a, in a way that kind of interacts with their other creditors. But something you definitely want to want to do. We've had people that have called us and said, you know, oh no, we're owed you know ten million dollars, and you know, here's we sent our stuff to you know Florida, and how do we get it back? And it's like, you know, they missed all the the five points they could have, they, the five opportunities they could have. They've already passed, and so um, something to keep in mind. Right, and and again, and and uh, not to harp too much on the on the 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 old intercreditor issue uh, theme, but here's another area where um, if, if if the if the vendor or contractor is really serious about protecting its its rights as a as a creditor. Um, there are likely to be some conflicts with the other um, with the other uh, project lenders, and 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 that's an area that uh, ideally uh, needs to be hammered out in advance at the at the transaction negotiation stage, and 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 not left for um, uh, for fighting out in court or something later. The last slide is really just a summary of, of uh, why security is important if you're a contractor or a vendor um, making, uh, extending financing to a project. Uh, if, if you, you know, from, from the creditor side, you want to be secured. It gives you a lot of important uh, rights, uh, uh, both, both as against the, the owner and, and, and as against other, other creditors. And of course, from the project owner's side, uh, it really it, it limits your flexibility. Um, if, if, for example, you want you wanted to sell or dispose of the uh, the assets that are the collateral, you you may not be able to do that if your if your vendor has a security interest in them. So, okay. So Ed, with that, it. we're at yeah we're at the top of the hour. On if there's any fo you know follow up question or or, or that, that any of the, the you know attendees have, feel free to reach out to us and shoot us an email or, or, or give us a ring. And with that, thank you, audience. Thank you, presenters. And we look forward to seeing you at the fifth session. Thank you. And this does conclude today's conference call. Thank you all for your participation.